Thank you, Judy. Welcome, everybody. Um, I was going to show this a little later, but um, I'll show it now because it's only the second time that I've ever seen all the buoys lit up like this. Um, and some of my guys are actually out right now at this buoy right here. We're in the operational phase of the project, so they're out there doing maintenance on the system. So before they pull it, I want to show it because it'll probably go green here shortly. But um, again, this is, before I move on, this is Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. The buoys are placed in what we call the TSS, which is the Transportation um, Separation Scheme for tankers and ships going into Boston Harbor. So as the tankers and ships go in, they go on, there's an inbound and an outbound lane. And then these buoys here in Cape Cod Bay um, they belong to the Mass Division of Marine Fisheries, who's also part of the network. But the other interesting thing is, I mean, there's only less than 400 right whales in the world, and about a quarter of them are now in Cape Cod Bay. Um, I was fortunate enough last Wednesday, well, I've been working on this project since 2003, and I've never seen a right whale until last Wednesday. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to go out on the Shearwater out of Provincetown, and they were everywhere. It was amazing. So um, I think, so back in 2003, I got a call from Chris Clark at Cornell. He was a director of bioacoustics there, that they had software they had developed to listen and detect the vocalization of right whales. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to move forward and make that system real time, where he could, the, the Software in the buoy could detect a right wave vocalization. It would transmit the data via iridium phone or cell phone or, uh, or Global Star back to Cornell. They could look at it and eventually notify ships in the area that there was whales there. And if there were whales there, they could you know, post a marine mammal watch, slow the ships down, and, uh, and try to reduce you know, the risk of uh, killing a whale via a vessel impact. And so we partnered up with Cornell, um, whose job was we design, build, deploy, and maintain the systems that are currently in the TSS in, uh, in Boston Harbor and Cape Cod Bay. Cornell's part was the software, the website, and to, get that, to collect the information, study it, and then eventually get it out to the ships um, that were coming into the TSS into the LNG terminals that um, are being built in Boston Harbor. So I'm going to briefly go to the website and get, show a short, a short um, movie um, about the right whale. Whoops, not that one. He originally started in Cape Cod Bay. That one. 
and then we can move on. The North Atlantic right whale, I'm not sure. Five feet and up to seventy tons. It's one of the largest animals in the ocean. With fewer than four hundred remaining in the world, it's also among the most endangered. White whales spend much of the year feeding in the rich waters off New England and Canada, just a few miles from major cities. Dinner every day is some two million calories of plankton, and right whales spend hours catching. Long, gray fringes of baleen hang from the jaw, straining millions of tiny plankton into a cavernous mouth as the whale swims slowly through the murky water. Abundant, <coughs> tiny food clouds these northern waters, making North Atlantic right whales extremely hard to film underwater. In the relatively clear water of the southern hemisphere, this southern right whale, a closely related species, offers a better view of a whale's calm grace beneath the surface. Adults spend much of their time on their own or traveling with a calf, but they sometimes gather by the dozens to bask, blow, splash, and flirt for hours at a time, seemingly oblivious to their surroundings. North Atlantic right whales live along the busy Atlantic seaboard where they're constantly in the path of shipping vessels. A 70-ton whale is no match for commercial ships that can weigh more than 90,000 tons. Collisions are usually deadly. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology is part of a coalition working to warn ship captains about whales in their path. With our partners, perhaps we can keep these majestic animals from disappearing. So, Chris Clark and I, back in 2003, we were able to um, assemble a team of engineers here at Hui. I was the lead on that, and I, I took the easy route out. I surrounded myself with a lot of people smarter than I am. And so, through the years, we were able to um, let me just put this up. We were able to um, focus on solving one, one major problem. The major problem was is that a hydrophone, which is kind of like a microphone, and it's, it's very sensitive. And, it's the, and with any surface buoy, it's, it's a surface follower. So as the buoy goes up and down, so does the hydrophone. And the hydrophone, and with the friction of the water, as the hydrophone goes up and down, it creates flow noise. And it saturates out the hydrophone, kind of like when you blow into a microphone. The same thing happens. And so the ability to detect the right whale from any distance or any sea state, you know, as soon as it blows 10 knots, the buoy's moving and that's it. You can't hear anything. You're deaf. And so um, along with Dr. Walter Paul here, um, we were able to um, solve that problem. So this is a slide from um, Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. This is data um, over the past 24 years of right whale sighting. And this is the, the old TSS, which is a transportation se um, separation scheme in Boston. And the dotted line is the new one. And so I think it was back in 2006, NOAA mandated that they, they shift the TSS from its current location up north where there's, there's, there were less whale sightings or less density. So. And back in 2006, I mean, you've probably read in the papers that um, there's a bunch of um, oil, com oil companies, Accelerate Energy is one of them, Sewage Energy is another, that have filed petitions, I mean, filed um, licenses to build deep water LNG terminals off the coast of Gloucester in Boston. So as part of their license and part of the, the agreement with NOAA, NOAA mandated to these energy companies that they have a method of detecting 
right whales when the LNG tankers came in and out of Boston. And so with, in order to abide by the license, Accelerate Energy funded um, the technology for developing these buoy systems that we currently have in the TSS in Mass Bay. The, there's one terminal already built. It's the Northeast Gateway Energy Bridge. It's about 1.8 miles west of Stellwagen Bank, and it's about 18 miles south of Gloucester. So back in the summer of 2007, we were funded to deploy six of the detection moorings along the construction of the pipeline. They laid pipeline um, five feet under the bottom from where the energy um, terminal was to be over in and into the existing um, pipeline that came from Boston up uh, to the North Shore. So that construction phase took about six months, um, and, which lasted from May to, uh, I think it was about November. Um, and so once the construction phase was over, we went into what we call um, the operational phase. So with the operational phase, the LNG tanker um, comes into Boston. Um, the gas is actually stored as a liquid, and they regasify it, and then they pump it into the pump line. But it's kind of cool, because they have a flexible riser pipe to a buoy system that actually goes up inside the ship. And so as they come over the site, this big riser buoy, which weighs about 50 tons, comes up and it locks into the ship, and it also moors the ship. So the ship is able to pinwheel around this mooring system as they offload the gas, which uh, is, takes approximately uh, 10 days. So once we came out of the construction phase, we went into you know, the operational phase, and so we, de we, we built and deployed these 10 systems in the TSS. Um, they're five miles apart. Um, they start, you know, about five miles from where the LNG terminal is, and they go east. The second LNG terminal is actually going to be up here uh, closer to Gloucester. The construction for that terminal starts um, July 1st. And so we're currently scrambling to get a bunch of systems built for that project. That's a two-year project that will start um, this year and then go back in the water in the springtime and they'll finish up eventually um, in 2009. And these three systems in, in, in Cape Cod Bay were uh, put there for supporting the Division of Mass Fisheries so they could do um, mammal, right, mammal detection in the bay. There's a lot of right whales that hang out near Sandwich and up near Float and Wellfleet. Um, and right now, there's about 100 whales in Cape Cod Bay. So when we designed this system, we had a bunch of requirements we had to meet. Um, and being from New England and being that we have major winter storms and everything, the system had to design, be designed to survive a 10-meter wave, or 33 feet. So, and it had, to do it, it had to do it consistently and it had to do it reliably because if a tanker was coming in and these buoys didn't work, then that was not good. Um, we also did a lot of work on the buoy design to, to lower what we call the O&M cost, which is the operation and maintenance cost. Um, to maintain these, we're actually in a position where we would maintain these systems for 25 to 40 years. So you want to make it really easy. When I'm 20 years older, I want to make sure that I can still do it. So we want to make it really easy. So, um, and then the other thing that we looked at was commonality, that each buoy didn't have specific parts. You know, if we have 16 or 30 of these things, part A should look like part Q. So we, we paid a lot of attention to that. Um, and then we needed to, the systems being that they're in the coastal regime, we needed to use a maybe a vessel opportunity, but we wanted to use a smaller class vessel because ship time is very expensive, and we wanted to be able to run out on um, the Tioga, or right now we're out on the, the Connecticut, which is another small vessel. So we wanted to have the systems be able to go off these coastal vessels. Um, and then we also, we, these things needed to be very easily deployed and recovered because we're doing so many of them. You know, we didn't want to spend 
you know, five or ten hours, you know, playing with this thing. We wanted to get it done in minutes. And so it was designed that we could deploy it in about 20 minutes and recover it in, in about five minutes. And, and, there, and the other thing was we were mandated by NOAA, being in a marine sanctuary, that we could leave no trace. That means we had to get the anchors back. So that was another um, problem we needed to get over. And the last but not least, the most important, it had to be acoustically quiet. Is, is being a passive acoustic system, the mooring couldn't generate noise. And so we put a lot of effort into making the system as quietly as possible. Even in, you know, in winter storms and gale force winds that the system needed to detect right whales in the vicinity. So this is one of the older designs we started with. And it's kind of got the same components as, say, your boat moorings in eel pond. It has chain and shackles and nylon. But the problem with that, it all generates noise. And it clanks and yanks and, and, and chines, and, and it just saturates the hydrophone up. And the other problem is that as the buoy goes up and down, so does the hydrophone. Big problem. So we, you know, we, did, we made one prototype deployment of this system. It was more proof of concept. Yes, we could hear whales over the hydrophone. Yes, we could transmit the data ashore. So the system worked, but the problem is when it blew 10 knots, we're done. So with the help of a bunch, with Wal the Dr. Walter Paul here at Huey and Mark Rosenbar and Don Peters and a whole bunch of other guys, um, we developed a new technology. And it's what we call the Gumby hose. Or it's basically, it's a piece of, it's a piece of very compliant radiator hose that stretches like a rubber band, but it has conductors vulcanized in the wall of the hose. And then, and, and they're like, I can relate it to my wife in the telephone cord. She can stretch that cord from one end of the house to the other, and the thing doesn't break. So basically, you have that, you have that telephone cord inside the wall of the hose, and then the hose gets filled with water and antifreeze. Water so it doesn't collapse at pressure in the antifreeze, so during the cold New England winters, you know, it doesn't turn into an icicle on us. And so, so this hose, this, this 50 foot hose, one of these 50 foot hoses will stretch 75 feet above its original length. So it'll stretch 50 feet and then another 75. And then it'll go to 120 feet before you break it. So it's an amazing thing. And so what it allowed us to do is we have a, a steel sphere here. And basically what that does, it keeps and here's the hydrophone. It keeps the hydrophone stiff all the time. So the hydrophone can't move because it's under constant tension. It's like having the hydrophone on a telephone pole. And then above the telephone pole is we have the compliance section, which stretches, and the buoy is able to ride up and down in the waves and follow the waves in, in major sea states. And so this was the design that we originally put out in back last year in the construction phase. And I think it was Tropical Storm Noel or, that came up in, like, November. I know it because it blew the weather station off my house. And so I sat up all night, and I clicked reload, looking at the buoy positions, because it was the first time that we've ever put them out in that kind of weather. And they were, I think in the Boston Bee Buoy, they had 25 to 30 foot seas for about 18 hours. And this, not only did the, the systems stay where they sh we put them, but they also were able to detect right whales during that whole big storm. So uh, we're lucky. So with all that engineering data in hand, we again, um, I'll touch a little bit more on the hose. Here's the hose. And the other thing the hose had to do was that as you stretch something, it would, you would typically generate more tension required. You keep pulling something. The harder you, typically you have to pull harder as you want to get more stretch. And so this hose was designed that basically, you know, as you stretch it twice its length, it didn't require that much tension to pull it because we wanted to keep the systems as small as we could so the tensions need to be low. So we didn't sink the buoy. Is we didn't want to have this big buoy to support this stretching hose. So it was designed specifically to, to stretch a long way without having to pull it a lot. And it's not much to look at, but it, 
it does its, it serves its purpose. It's a fi this is our 50-foot conducting stretch hose. Like I, it's got eight conductors in the wall, and the, in the conduct the hose is 50 foot, but each conducting length is a, each conductor is 192 feet long. So it's laid in there at a very what we call a, a very shallow helix angle. Rubber. Yeah, it's just rubber. It's built like a tire. It's got rubber. It's got cord. The cords in there to keep it from, you know, stretching to a certain length and breaking the conductors that are in there. So it's, but it basically, the rubber has the same properties as the tire, um, and the conductors are copper. And like, you know, with any copper wire, if you bend it, you break it. And so that's why it's set at a low helix angle. So that's allowed to stretch and contract without damaging the conductors because, it, you know, if a buoy's out there in the water for eight months, it sees millions and millions of cycles. It's constantly moving, constantly bending. And so the system has to be robust enough that you don't break conductors. And so we've... Is that a standard device? No. It was, it was developed here by a, a gentleman called Walter Paul. He's the father of the mother of all hoses, we call him. He's the hose guru. And he's, he's an amazing person. And he came out of the oil patch industry where they would use these in a horizontal for towing um, acoustic arrays. And so he's been here at Hooey now for about 20 years. And so I went, I went to him with this problem, and he helped me solve it. So. One of the things we do when we get a new hose, we like to stretch it. And so the problem is our crane can't, isn't tall enough to stretch the hose. So the bottom end of the, the ho this hose here is actually on the bottom of, of our well at the dock. So the other end of that hose is 50 foot down on the bottom of the well. And so we exercise it a few times. And then we take it down and we look at the, con you know, we measure the con voltage through the conductors and we ohm them out to make sure they're not broken. And then we, we're good to go. So, but you can, it's amazing to see this thing stretch. I mean, it's. So this was prior to the operational phase is we got the cookie cutter out and we made 10. Um, these are the buoys that we designed and built um, and eventually deployed for the, in the TSS for Accelerate Energy. Um, and it was. Right before the, I'll tell one little story, is right before the construction phase is we had a delivery problem with the hoses. And we were supposed to be in the water like, like June 5th. And the hoses were going to be late. So I had got on a conference call with all the people from Accelerate Energy, their lawyers, the lawyers' lawyers, and if, I wasn't, if we weren't in the water, Accelerate Energy would lose a million dollars a day. So we flew somebody down to North Carolina to drive the hoses up. And so we were actually, so we built the hoses that night, all, all weekend. We went to sea on Monday. We got all the six systems in with about 12 hours to spare before they started losing money. So I was, I was introduced to a whole new world. <laughs> I didn't like it. <laughs> Um, I threw this photo in. Um, again, it was the, the, the deployment of the original prototype, the original one we built with the first stretch holes. And so there's the buoy, there's the subsurface sphere, there's the hydrophone, here's the anchor. And the reason I put this in here is we spend a lot of time with dynamic modeling. We look at everything to make sure it's going to function, it's going to work the first time, no problem. Well, we. The issue is, you see the, the yellow, the polyforms? We chickened out, and we put extra flotation on it because we were afraid we were going to sink the buoy. But we didn't do it. So we dropped the anchor, and it was fine. Um, and again, this is, one of the, this is one of the new systems. And being the fact that these systems are so close to shore, we're able to access them by, on a, on a good day, a fishing boat or a Zodiac. And so what we did was we, we stuck the electronics outside of the, what we call the, the well, or, or where we put the batteries. And so Cornell is constantly wanting to upgrade their software, change this, change that, it broke. So, so they can come along in a small boat, you know, 
pull their canister out, pop a new one in, and go back to Cornell. Or we can go do it for them and mail it to them. So that's been, it's been a little different having a partner that's in New York, you know, looking at whales when they're not, they're not even near the water. So, but it's working pretty well. Um, just another photo. This is a system that we have off of Georgia. Um, again, it's just a take on the same thing. Um, again, the small little hydrophone. I mean, we build this elaborate equipment just to support this little hydrophone. And so this is uh, moored off of, um, there's one off of Georgia and one off of Florida. And again, they're down there. Um, they're, we, that's where the right whale goes in the winter time. I mean, goes in the winter time to calve and, and to feed. We'll go back. So for those people who haven't heard a right whale, that this site, we'll pick the sandwich buoy. It might not play over, though. I may not be able to download over the wire, so I'll try. Might take a second. I'll just push this over. But these are the, you can see the, the spectrograms of the right whale vocalization. There's the classic whoop, but it's not going to download for me, so, but I, I, I did put one on my desktop. So for those of you who have never heard of right whale, that's it. It's called an up call. Um, and so the system, what the systems allow, I mean, there's been, um, in talking to Chris Clark, is that they've learned a lot of things just by the acoustics. The fact that there's right whales up, there's a lot of right whales here in the wintertime where they didn't think there were that many. And there also, there was a misnomer that they spent the wind, when there's a big storm, and um, they wouldn't spend any time in Cape Cod Bay. That's false. There's whales in Cape Cod Bay during some of the biggest scales. And the other thing it allowed them to do was that they could, they'd have overflights to do population counts. And now they know if there's whales out there to go count. So they can, you know, they reduce their fuel costs so they don't have to go out there all the time and, uh, you know, look for whales that aren't there. So, there's one, and the other thing that I learned the other day, and I never heard this before, but I've never heard of a drumfish. It's actually called black drumfish. And this was off of the, the buoy. I don't know if you heard that. It's kind of weak. But it sounds like a, a big bass drum. And I've, and I've never heard that before. But, so they're hearing lots of sounds, even in Cape Cod Bay, Mass Bay, that they've never heard before. They're not sure where the sound's coming from. So there's species that, you know, they're still learning, you know, what the heck was that? And so, but um, to close this out, I would just want to show another little short video with my, with my co-PI, Mr. Clark, uh, that we, on the cruise we went out of the Connecticut to deploy some of these things. So let me just play this. It's kind of cool. We originally started in Cape Cod Bay putting three buoys in the bay to detect right whales. There right now, this is a, this is a real time present situation of these auto detection buoys monitoring for right whales in Cape Cod Bay. Most recently, a couple of months ago, we actually installed a network of 10 of these auto detection buoys right in the shipping lanes, right down the middle of the shipping lanes coming into and out of Boston. We can now go to that buoy, click on it and bring up the clips from that buoy. These blue and yellow buoys are the backbone of a new project to help save North Atlantic right whales in the Boston shipping lanes. Smart instruments on the buoys listen for whales, then send home a warning that can be relayed to nearby ships. A crew from Cornell and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution assembles the system's five main components at sea. The auto detection system includes a submerged hydrophone that captures underwater sounds like a microphone. 
sounds travel up cables inside this rubbery black mooring line designed to be quiet enough not to interfere with recordings. Through a giant yellow float that holds the hydrophone steady in the water. On up to a surface buoy which houses a computer and mobile phone. The computer analyzes the sounds, transmitting any calls that may be made by right whales back to Cornell. On station, depth here 100 feet, 30 meters. Every five miles along the shipping lane, a buoy goes into the water. The nearly 1,800 pound anchor is the last component over the side. As the anchor drops, the buoy snaps into position. in the water, it's working. We're getting real-time detections of right whales right in the middle of the shipping lane coming ready to Boston. The buoys are transmitting every 20 minutes, and these are every four hours, so we're getting data packages on average every two minutes. So this is a phenomenal influx of uh, material that has to be evaluated and validated, and this requires an enormous effort on the part of a team of people who are just constantly monitoring the data that are coming in. The correct identification of right whale calls is critical because those detections are what are being put up here as indications of right whales, and those indications are then being transmitted out to the ships that are then required to slow down to 10 knots so that they can't kill a right whale, hopefully, and won't run them over. So, one the current system that we have out there now is on 24-7, but it's, it's not manned 24-7 until an LNG tanker comes into Boston. So the way the system works, we get a detection. It gets transmitted back to Cornell. They look at the data, and then they analyze the data. And then if, they have a, if there is a tanker in the TSS, they notify the tanker. Um, Virus iridium phone, and the, and the LNG tankers are required to stand an MMO wall. And they put a marine mammal observer out to look for the right whale, and they're required to slow down. They slow down to tw 10 knots. And if there's a detection in that TSS in the past 24 hours, then they must transit the TSS at, at 10 knots. And the hope is in the future is that um, through the automated, the AIS system for the Coast Guard, the automated identification system, that all vessels that transit the TSS and transit through Cape Cod Bay will be notified and, and slow down to 10 knots. Right now it's voluntarily. So, but the hope is that you know, as the system develops, um, it'll, we, we'll, it'll be able to do, um, do that kind of stuff. So I think that both covers it. Thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. Well, you mentioned the uh, um, analysis in the subsurface buoy, and then you mentioned the analysis at Cornell. What is the difference between? Well, the buoy. What the buoy does is the buoy. The, the analysis is done on the surface buoy. Is it looks and rates the detections from one to ten? Is it a filtering? Uh, you, the right now, right now, that's the surface. The electronics in the buoy is only looking for a right whale call. So if a humpback goes by, I'm not going to. Well, It's just it's looking at it's looking at the, the frequency sweep from about thirty five kilohertz up to three hundred and fifty kilohertz. It's a very you know, that whale call is Yeah, it's it's uh whoops. That's what they're looking they're looking for that sweep. And they have they have software and an algorithm to just look at that sweep. Yeah, the, the How well can your system show actually where the right whales are? Well, right now we, 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 
Right. Right now we can't locate, we can't pinpoint the position of the whales. It can be done. You know, the buoys have to be positioned much differently than they are now. But you could triangulate on a right whale call and, and pinpoint where it is, but it's moving. So, you know, this, this guy's moving all the time, and, you know, so I think initially when I, I got involved with this thing and I said, you know, unless we know where they are, you know, what's the point? But I changed my mind because if that whale is within a radius of five miles around that buoy, that's good enough. Because he's moving anyways. And so if the, sh you know, if the ship does slow down and they go on high alert, there's people looking out. I mean, you know, the chances are that they will reduce, you know, the, um, the, the, you know, the strike capability. I mean, you know, the percentage. That's what I was going to ask you. Is there something like the sonar that they could use on the ship to check for yeah. sort of nighttime? Right. But the problem is the, y you're inducing more noise into the water than, you know, I mean, the, the water's already noisy enough. I mean, the way, I mean, it's like, I think Chris Clark says, it's like underwater Logan Airport. I mean, these ships are inducing all kinds of noise into the system. And so we took a different approach. Listen for it. Don't induce any more noise in the water than you have to. And so, um, but yes, there are other people looking at mammal detection using acoustics. And so. Are doing this? Yeah, I, I think right now it's only mandated that the LNG tankers that come into the, the Northeast Gateway Terminal and the Neptune Terminal have to do this. But they're promoting the fact that, look at, you know, if this is available to you, can you voluntarily, you know? No, not yet. No, that had, no, not yet. N not yet. No, I mean, we've only had the system in. The system went in in January. Um, and again, um, so it's, it's, in its, it's, it's in its infancy. So hopefully, um, you know, as we move out, and if we do stay involved for the 25 or the 40 years for the life of the port, that more people will adopt something like this. Um, and again, it would get the cost down, too. Correct. Is that active? Yes. It just. I want to send this down to my grandchildren. Yeah, it's um, listenforwhales.org. It, it's listenforwhales.org. It just came online on Monday. Does it show some of these? And that's where all the clips came from, the videos. And you can also scroll through there, and you've got some of the spectrograms. You can play some of the sounds. Yeah, and each right whale vocalization is specific to the animal. They can actually tell, you know, which animal, they, you know, on a small scale, not on a grand scale, but, you know, they, if they, they can actually detect which um, right whale made that call. The ones in the bay are the, um, are the older style. Um, they're the same. No, they're not the exact same, but they're going to upgrade this summer. No. Not right now. No, because the, the way you can triangulate is you have to have a very accurate clock on the buoys so that as they get a call, they know so you can triangulate you know, distance from where the call came from, and they don't have that. Correct. Accelerate energy. Um, I'm not sure what Cornell's getting, but um, I think over the life of the port, it's going to cost them around forty million dollars, about a million dollars a year. 
about 20 million. But I'm, don't quote me on that because I'm not sure. I mean, the, the O&M phase of this is that, you know, we just came into the, what we call the O&M, the operation maintenance. And, you know, we're looking at, you know, maybe down the road, you know, trying to get the, you know, we're trying to make the systems green now, but we want to do wind and solar. So we don't have to go out there as frequently, and we don't have to throw away a bunch of batteries all the time. So, um, so if we do that, we're probably looking at somewhere about maintaining the system somewhere between 200 and 400 k a year. So, I think. Yeah, well, if he's doing 10 knots, it's 55 miles, so about five and a half hours. Well, I mean, he's required, the that tankers are required if there was a detection in the past 24 hours. He needs to go through the TSS at 10 knots. So, and I, since we put that in in January, since I've been looking at it, I've never seen not one of, the, you know, one of those boots not be lit up. So, yeah, I think they're pretty much going to do 10 knots. <laughs> Yeah, but I think, you know, from that aspect, you, probably, you might be right. But from a scientific aspect where they're looking at, you know, how many whales spend the winter here, you know, where the, you know, how, you know, they're learning a lot scientifically, not, but, you know, but again, it's a, I think the ultimate goal is to have all the vessels that transit Cape Cod Bay and into the TSS and near Stellwagen that they slow down. So, I mean, maybe in the wintertime that, in just you know November when the whales go south through that you know there might be times where they can zip through they're doing 18 knots. So, but, yeah. Well, right now, well they, the ones for the port, um, they only came in once. They came in to commission the buoy system, but there hasn't been an LNG tanker come into the Northeast Gateway with um, LNG yet this year. Um, the reason being is they're getting much more money over in Korea than they could here. So it's going to Korea. So, but um, um, that, that, you know, that will change. I mean, it'll, it'll, again, we're going into the summer months, so the demand for energy in New England is a lot less. So, so they go to Korea. It's only accelerate energy in Neptune. So. And how long did you say it took them all day? It takes them about 10 days. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I'm not sure what the whole process is, but they, when they load the LNG, it goes into a liquid state. And then they regasify it. And then they pump it. And so once the, once the fuel's offloaded, they release the buoy and they leave. And then... The thought is during the winter time that would probably be a tanker there almost continuously. It depends on the demand for natural gas in New England. So, and the reason they kind of built the port was that um, Boston's like at the end of the pipeline for all the LNG. So you know by the time it got to us, there was nothing left. So they built you know, and they built it offshore for lots of reasons, where safety-wise and all that stuff. So. I don't think so. I mean, you know, the system's only been in for since January. But I think what it's done, it, well, it's, you know, it's heightened everybody's awareness of what, you know, it, it's got a lot of, it's got, it's given the right will more publicity than it had. And so, and especially this year where you have 100, you know, typically there's like only 35 right whales in the bay, and now there's 70 to 100. So, it's pretty cool. Well, a tanker that big can't, I mean, you know, they're so massive that 
the faster they go, the longer it takes them to slow down or maneuver. So the slower they go, it's easier for them to stop. It's just, it's mass. I mean, it, they're so massive. So the idea is you stop More reaction time. You know, if he had a turn, and so. Um, I guess if I was going to get hit by a car, I'd rather get it at 10 miles an hour than 20. <laughs> oh, kind of like that. How does the general public recreational boater and the people being notified here? Other than um, word of mouth and the website and everything, that's about it. So Not right now. I mean, but again, it's the program's in its infancy, so maybe it's things have developed that um, it'll be available to, to more people and I mean I, I like the website just so I can go hear all these cool sounds that you know I've never heard before and it's like you know I, I didn't think that would interest me but I sit there every night going wow that's really cool so. yeah I, I mean the buoys are in notice of mariners but you know the Coast Guard you know they're busy and so you know they need to you know safety first and so um, but you know, there could be down the road, there could be some website that people go to that, um, to notify, you know, the, you know, the weekend boater that, you know, he's, he's got to slow down. And I mean, I've noticed in today's paper that, um, that the Risen Mass Fisheries, you know, they closed a lot of Cape Cod Bay to the fishermen not allowed to set their nets or pull their pots anywhere within 500 feet of a right away. So, and I've never seen that before. Right, because right. a lot of these whales already have names. I mean, I was out with these two marine mammal observers on the Shearwater. They they saw a tail. They knew that's Rosie and that's Gloria and that's so, you know. And you could you, you, right, and you could put a tag on these whales and get their vocalization, and then you know you could, you know, well Rosie's over there by buoy eight, you know, and I'm sure that somebody will write a proposal to do that someday. All oh, right. Yeah, the NOAA site. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right. Right. That's about five nautical miles. But again, it all depends on the ambient noise in the water. If it's a very, if there aren't a lot of ships out there, then the range is much greater. You could probably hear it across Cape Cod Bay. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the, we've done some testing with it, and I think, you know, the published is we can hear five nautical miles, but you can hear a lot further. And, you know, on some days you're not going to hear as far because there's lots of ambient noise in the water. So, I mean, that's what, you know, we were able to quiet the system down enough that, you know, in any sea state, I mean, we can hear right away. So, I mean. Right, I mean, I don't. I mean, I you know, I've you know, it's I've seen those buoys you know it's, when it's been blowing seventy, and they're still clicking away getting detection. So, um, I think you know, it, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's no way to know how you know what the loss is over, um, you know, sea state wise. I mean, but you know, I, I in the old system I could tell you, but in the new system. I can't tell you, but, but we, uh, it's, they seem to be, you know, they're able to pick up, you know, these vocalizations in extremely rough weather.
Yeah, that, that op center goes 24-7 two days before the arrival of an LNG tanker. And then they'll, you know, then once the tanker's at the terminal, they stand down. And then when the tanker's getting ready to leave, they go 24-7 again. That's at Cornell, yeah. 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 Um, it's, the ship is, I mean, they're on a tight schedule. I mean, you know, you can't. It's due to Homeland Security regulations. I can't tell you. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. yeah. It, Right. I mean, there's only been Accelerate Energy who built the first original port, who funded this work, that had only one tanker come in. It was empty. And they came in to commission the, the buoy system. So they came in, they docked up to the buoy, undocked, move around, and they left. I've never been there, so I, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, they have a bunch of... Yeah, uh, they probably have a bunch of grad students that sit there and man, and man their this stuff. Yeah, I mean the buoys are in fixed positions, and and so, and again, you know, the buoys transmit every 15 to 20 minutes, and so you're kind of in that quasi real time detection range. Because it's, it's like your telephone cord. It's laid at a very, what they call a low helix angle, and as it stretches, I mean, my wife can bring one from the kitchen all the way to the dining room, and that thing's still going, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, right, right now we're on a four months around a four-month turn. So um, we went out. The boys left last night. They turned in five buoys. They'll bring the buoys back tonight, tomorrow morning. Then we'll, we'll refurb those. Then we'll go out a week from Monday. So you pull those in? Yeah, we bring a new buoy out with fresh batteries. We recover the morning, redeploy it, and then bring the used buoys back, and we turn those around and then go back out again. But the hope is that... Um, that just a buoy. Everything gets re we redeploy the, the major component. Yeah, it's it's under a lot of tension. It's a safety thing. It's just easier and quicker to bring the system back, undo a bunch of bolts and connectors, and put it back and redeploy it. It's really it's not it's not a lot of labor. No. No. no the, yeah, the anchors we recover. The anchors were mandated to recover. We have a what we call a line pack. So as the as that subsurface float comes up, it brings a line up that's attached to the anchor. So if we recover the mooring, then we go back and we pull the anchor up. Yeah, we, we have to. Yeah, we we can't leave anything on the marine sanctuary. So we got to bring it all back. Yeah, yeah, we put it back. Yeah, but it, I understand. <laughs> yeah, but it's they, but. The thing is, if we didn't bring them back, I mean, if we left these anchors over 25 years, we're dropping, you know, ten, you know, 18,000 pounds of anchors every year. And they're going to start to pile up. So it's, yeah. Yeah, but this, I mean, yeah, but you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and I mean you'd be surprised you know it's scary stuff when you're underneath that thing trying to undo it so it's just it's a safety issue I mean it's just it takes a little more time but you know we all come back with all the fingers so that's what we try to do uh, well since we put them in in um, January we haven't had we haven't we had one buoy not go offline it got kind of deaf um, so we went out there and fixed it, and so basically, all the buoys have been online since January fourth. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.